And they came to Jericho, and he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd. Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard it was the Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. You may be seated. This sermon was written by George Whitfield. It was preached perhaps right around 1740. I have shortened it some. I have updated the language. And I've, I've moved the uh, scripture quotes uh, to the ESV. But it's, it's all his, uh, his brainstorming that put it together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this worship service and we pray for the sermon now that you will guide my words that they may be glorifying to you and edifying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. When the Apostle Peter was describing Jesus of Nazareth in one of his sermons to the Jews, he ascribed to him a short but glorious and exalted character that he went about doing good. That is, he sought occasions for doing good. It was his food and drink to do the works of him that sent him while the days of his public ministry lasted. Justly was he called by the prophet the son of righteousness. For as the sun in the natural sky diffuses its quickening and reviving beams through the universe, so whenever this son of righteousness, the blessed Jesus, arose, he arose with healing under his wings. He was indeed a prophet like Moses and proved that he was the Messiah by the miracles he performed. Though with this significant difference, the miracles of Moses in accordance with the Old Testament dispensation were miracles of judgment. The miracles of Jesus who came to bear our sicknesses and heal our infirmities were miracles of mercy. These were done not only for the cure of people's bodies, but also for the conversion of their precious and immortal souls. Sometimes the same person was the subject of both of these mercies. As a glorious proof of this, we have the miraculous cure wrought on a poor blind beggar named Bartimaeus. We begin with the 46th verse of this chapter. And they, our Lord and his disciples, came to Jericho. Jericho was a place devoted by Joshua to the curse of God, yet even this place yields converts to Jesus. Zacchaeus had been called there previously, and Bartimaeus, as we shall now hear, was called now. Jesus came to Jericho. Let not his ministers, if providence points out their way, shun going to most unlikely places to do good, as some of the elect may be there. Verse 46 tells us that Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, a great mob or rabble, as the high priests of that generation called them, for they were the constant followers of Jesus of Nazareth. It was the poor that received his gospel. The common people heard him gladly and followed him from place to place. Not all who followed him were his true disciples. No, some followed him only for his loaves, Others, out of curiosity, though some undoubtedly followed to hear and be edified by his gracious words. Jesus knew this, and he he was also aware of how displeasing this crowd was to some of the rulers of the Jewish church. Nevertheless, our blessed Lord only sent them home once, and that was after they had been with him for three days. Similarly, gospel ministers should preach to poor souls that follow them to hear the word, whatever their background. At the same time, they should caution people against thinking themselves Christians just because they follow Christ's ministers. 
Many people followed Jesus out of Jericho, but many of them were eventually offended by him, and afterwards many cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Who would depend on popularity? It is like the morning cloud or the early dew that passes away. But how popular the blessed Jesus was. He could not be hidden, go where he would. Many people followed him. He scarcely had time to eat bread. Happy are those who are called to prominent roles in the church and to more abundant in their labors that their Jesus has trodden this dangerous path before them. Popularity is a fiery furnace and no one but he who kept the three children amidst Nebuchadnezzar's flames can preserve popular ministers from being hurt by it. But we can do all things through Christ strengthening us. But to proceed, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. He was begging to get his bread, having no other way as he had lost his sight. But he is not chastised for begging, neither should we discommend others for doing so when providence calls them to it. It is our pride that often makes us unwilling to be beholden. Jesus was not thus minded. He lived, as it were, upon alms. The women that followed him ministered to his needs. Bartimaeus, not being able to dig, begged for his living, and, in order to make order to make a better trade of it, sat beside the highway, most likely near the gate of the city, where people must necessarily pass in and out. But though he had lost his sight, his hearing was perfect. Happy was it for Bartimaeus that he could hear, for in all probability, upon hearing the noise and clamor of the many people that followed after our Lord, his curiosity made him inquire into the cause of it. And someone or another told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And what does Bartimaeus do when he hears Jesus? We are told, verse 47, And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. Though the eyes of his body were shut, the eyes of his mind were opened, so that he saw perhaps more than most of the multitude that followed after Jesus. As soon as he heard of him, he began to cry out, which he would not have done had he not heard of him before, and believed also that he was both able and willing to restore sight to the blind. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. The people called him Jesus of Nazareth. Bartimaeus calls him Jesus, son of David. He believed him to be the Messiah who was to come into the world, to whom the Lord God was to give the throne of his father David, and of whose kingdom there would be no end. This was he of whom it was foretold in Isaiah 35, that when he should come, the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Have mercy upon me is the natural language of a soul brought to lie down at the feet of a sovereign God. Here is no laying claim to a cure by way of merit, no proud, self-righteous, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are, no bringing in a reckoning of performances, nor any doubting of Jesus' power or willingness to heal him. Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks, and in the language of the poor, broken-hearted publican, he cries out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. One would have thought that such a moving petition as this would have melted the hearts of the multitude into compassion and induced some, at least, to help to lead him to the blessed Jesus. But instead of that, we are told, verse 48, that many rebuked him. They told him to be silent. They looked on him as unworthy of the attention of Jesus of Nazareth. This was, no doubt, very discouraging to blind Bartimaeus. For opposition is the worst when it comes from those who are esteemed followers of the Lamb. But opposition only serves to wet the edge of true devotion. And therefore Bartimaeus, instead of being silenced by their rebukes and threatenings, cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Still, he breaks into the same humble language, and if Jesus, the son of David, will have mercy on him, he does not care what some of his peevish followers said of or did to him. 
This was not a vain repetition, but a devout reiteration of his request. We may sometimes repeat the same words and yet not be guilty of that vain speaking which our Lord condemns. For our Lord himself prayed in his agony and said twice the same words, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Similarly, Bartimaeus repeated, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And how does the son of David treat him? Does he join with the multitude and tell him to be silent? Or does he go on thinking him unworthy of his attention? No, for it says in verse 49, and Jesus stopped. Though he was in a journey, maybe in haste, Jesus stopped and said, call him. Why did he do so? To teach us to be condescending and kind, even to poor beggars, and tacitly to reprove the blind, misguided zeal of those who had told Bartimaeus to be silent. By this, our Lord also prepares the multitude to take better notice of the blind man's faith and of his own mercy and power exerted in the healing of him. Jesus commanded Bartimaeus to be called, and they called him. Who called him? It may be those who a little before had told him to be silent. For it often happens that our opposers and discouragers afterward become our friends. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's Proverbs 16, verse 7. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. Verse 49. These words imply haste and a kind of concern for the blind man's relief. Oh, that we might learn to be patient and long-suffering towards our opponents. For many oppose awakened souls, not out of enmity, but through prejudice and misinformation, and a real, though perhaps false, persuasion that their relations are going in a wrong way. By and by they may be convinced that Christ is indeed calling those they oppose, and then they may become real and open friends to the cause and work of God. If not, it is our duty to behave with meekness toward all, and not to render berating for berating, but rather blessing, knowing that we are called to do that so that we may inherit a blessing. Jesus did not break out into harsh language against those opposers, nor did Bartimaeus. Our Lord stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Bartimaeus, throwing off his cloak, rose, and blind as he was, he came to Jesus. His cloak was probably a large garment that he wore to screen himself from the rain and cold. Undoubtedly, it was the most necessary and valuable garment that he had. One would have thought that he should have taken this cloak along with him. But he knew very well that if he did so, it might hang about his heels, and thereby his reaching Jesus would be at least hindered, if not prevented entirely. Therefore, valuable as it was to him, he cast it away. The word implies that he threw it off from his shoulders with great suddenness and resolution, knowing that if he got a cure, which he now hoped for by Christ calling him, he should never want his cloak again. And that is what anyone will do who is earnest about coming to Jesus here or seeing and enjoying him in his kingdom eternally hereafter. They will cut off a right hand. They will pluck out a right eye. They will leave father and mother, husband and wife, yes, and even their own lives rather than not be his disciples. The Apostle Paul, therefore, exhorts Christians to lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, alluding to the custom of the Romans who wore long garments. This was the sort of garment that Bartimaeus had wrapped about him. But he, to show that he sincerely desired to recover his sight, cast it away, arose, and came to Jesus. And what treatment did Jesus give him? Did he say, stay away from me, you obnoxious, noisy beggar? No, he said to him, what do you want me to do for you? This seems like an odd question. For didn't our Lord know what he wanted? 
Yes, he did. But the Lord Jesus dealt with him as he deals with us. He will make us acknowledge our wants, that we may confess our dependence upon him and upon his divine assistance. The blind man immediately replies, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. I can almost see the poor creature listening to the voice of our Savior and responding with looks and gestures that reveal the inward earnestness of his soul. He cries out, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. It is though he had said, I believe you are the Messiah who is to come in the, into the world. I have heard of your fame, O oh Jesus, and hearing the glad tidings of your coming this way, I cry to you, asking not for silver and gold, but what you alone can give me, Lord, that I might recover my sight. No sooner does he ask, but he receives. In verse 52, Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight. With Jesus' words, there went out a power. And he that spoke light out of darkness, saying, Let there be light, and there was light, commanded light into this poor blind beggar's eyes, and behold, there was light. The miracle was instantaneous. Immediately he received his sight. O oh, happy Bartimaeus, your eyes are now opened, and the very first object you behold is your ever-loving, altogether lovely Jesus. I can almost see you filled with wonder and admiration, and all the disciples and the multitude gazing around you. And now, having received your sight, why do you not obey the Lord's command and go your way? Why do you not hurry to fetch the cloak that you just now cast away? No, no, with his bodily eyes, I believe he also received a fresh edition of spiritual sight. And he felt such a divine attraction towards his all-bountiful benefactor that instead of going his way to fetch his cloak, he followed Jesus in the way. By his actions, he says with a faithful, honest-hearted Ruth, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. He followed Jesus in the way, the narrow way, the way of the cross, and I have no doubt that he has followed, them to, followed him to his crown, and is at this time sitting with him at the right hand of the Father. And now, my dear congregation, how do you find your hearts affected at the relation of this notable miracle which Jesus wrought? Are you not ready to break out into language the song of Moses and say, Who is like you, O Lord, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Marvelous are your works, O Jesus, and our souls know that well. Or are you like the natural man who goes no further than the outward court of the scripture and reads this and the other miracles of our blessed Savior just in the same manner as he reads any other piece of literature? God forbid that we should be satisfied in only hearing this as a matter of fact. For I tell you, O man, I tell you, O woman, whoever you are, that sits this day under a preached gospel, that if you are in a natural state, you are as blind in your soul as Bartimaeus was in his body, a blind child of a blind father, even of your father Adam, who lost his sight when he lost his innocence, and passed down his blindness, justly inflicted upon you and me and his whole posterity. The scriptures everywhere represent fallen man not only as spiritually blind, but also dead. In our fallen nature, we no more know the way of salvation by Jesus Christ than Bartimaeus, when he was blind, knew the colors of the rainbow. This, I trust, some of you begin to feel. And you're being made aware of your natural blindness and crying earnestly to Jesus is a sign that you are awakened by his Holy Spirit. I will, therefore, in the language of those who afterwards, afterwards encouraged Bartimaeus, say to you, Arise, take comfort, for I trust Jesus is calling you. Follow the example of Bartimaeus. Cast away your cloak. Lay aside every weight and the sin which most easily besets you. Arise and come to Jesus. He commands me by his written word to call to you and say, Come unto him, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and he will refresh you. He will give you rest. Be not afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. Behold, he comes forth to meet you. 
Oh, then cry out to him who is mighty and willing to save you. Lay yourselves at the feet of sovereign grace. Say to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus will answer you. He will not ignore your prayer. Blind as you are, you shall receive your sight. Satan and unbelief will suggest many objections to you. Your carnal relations will also join forces with them and tell you to be silent. One will tell you that your blindness is too severe to be cured. Another that it is too late. A third that Jesus would not have mercy upon such a poor, blind, despicable beggar as you. But the more they tell you to be silent, the more you cry out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, Savior, friend of sinners, Son of David, and therefore a Son of Man. Gracious words. Be encouraged by them to draw close to him. Though you are a poor beggar, do not think that your condition is too poor for Jesus to take notice of. He came into the highways and hedges to call such poor beggars as you in. If you are rich, do not think of yourself too high to stoop down to Jesus, for he is the King of kings, and you will never be truly rich until you are made rich in Jesus. Do not fear being despised or losing a little worldly honor. One sight of Jesus will make up for all that. You will find something so inviting, so attracting, so satisfying in the altogether lovely Lamb of God that every worldly enjoyment will sicken and die and vanish before you. And you will no more desire your former vain and trifling amusements than Bartimaeus, after he had received his sight, desired to go back and fetch his cloak. Oh, that there may, may be such many such blind beggars among you this day. Assuredly, he has promised, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. What encouraging words. Sinners, do you believe this? Arise then, be of good comfort, for Jesus is indeed calling you. Some of you, I trust, have obeyed this invitation and have had a sight of him long ago. I know then that you will bless and love him. And if he should say to you, as he did to Bartimaeus, go on your way, your answer will be, we love our master and we will not go from him. But hear these words of exhortation. Show that you have indeed seen him and that you do indeed love him by following him in the way. I mean in the way of the cross, in the way of his ordinances, and in the way of his holy commandments. Alas, the love of many becomes cold, and few are those that follow Jesus rightly in the way. Few are those that cast away their garments so heartily as they should. Some idol or another hangs about us and hinders us in running the race that is set before us. Awake, therefore, and put on strength. Shake yourselves from the dust. Arise and follow Jesus more closely in the way than you ever did before. Lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. Provide right paths for your feet, for though the way is narrow, it is not long. Oh, that you may get a fresh sight of him again this day. A sight of Jesus, like the sun rising in the morning, dispels the darkness and gloom that lies upon the soul. Take therefore a fresh view of him, O believers, and never rest until you are translated to see him as he is and to live with him forevermore in the kingdom of heaven. Even so, Lord Jesus, amen and amen.